Thank you, uh, Sergio, for this overview. And I give the microphone to, to Manuela to go for one of her famous topics, which is cardiac toxicity. Thank you, Anna. It's a pleasure for me to be here and to talk about cardiac toxicity. So when we look at the incidence, what has been published from the randomized phase three trials, it appears that it all comes down actually to a quite interesting amount of congestive heart failure with sunitinib and of higher grade uh, ischemia when using sorafenib. And this topic was quite interesting for us when we started using these agents and based on, on observations that we made in, in individual patients, we came to the conclusion to investigate this phenomenon in a prospective observational study. And uh, in 74 patients who were treated with sunitinib or sorafenib, we actually found that uh, this phenomenon of cardiac toxicity might be um, underreported because uh, up to 34% of our patients presented with some cardiac events, uh, if, which we defined either as an increase in cardiac troponin T or CKMB or symptomatic arrhythmia, uh, ejection fraction decline, and so on. Almost half of our patients had changes in ECG, 18% had typical clinical symptoms, and uh, almost 10% uh, of these patients were seriously compromised. However, the interesting part here is that all patients were considered eligible for TKI continuation after they had recovered from this event. Meanwhile, I'm not um, surprised anymore when a patient of mine, for example, under sunitinib presents with an ECG like that with deep negative T waves and a typical angina, or here another patient on sorafenib who presented with dizziness and ECG revealed um, AV block type 2 Wenkebach. And meanwhile, I have also seen Pazopani patients with acute ischemia. I'm not surprised anymore because uh, when we look at the mode of action of the drugs and at all the factors that may influence a cardiac toxicity, um, we kind of expect that something may happen to one or the other patient. And this is, a, in fact, a multifactorial process that consists of mode of action of the tumor drug. It also can be triggered by a non-cardiac side effect of the tumor drug. And finally, comorbidities of the patient, as well as the co-medication of the patient, may trigger a cardiac event. Let me start with the mode of action of the tumor drug. We should be aware that all these kinases that we know to inhibit with multi-kinase inhibitors are from a physiological point of view highly relevant, not only for the heart, but certainly also for the heart. For example, CKIT, which is inhibited by sunitinib and sorafenib, is important for homing of bone marrow-derived cardiac stem cells into sites of uh, post-myocardial uh, uh, myocardial infarction injury, or also in stem cell differentiation. VEGF, of course, one may expect that this is very important for the heart because of uh, its role for myocardial capillary density, stem cell differentiation, but also for vasodilation through nit nitric oxide activation and so on. The platelet-derived growth factor, very important. There are studies in uh, conducted in cardiology where um, platelet-derived growth factors are injected at sites of myocardial infarction with very good uh, benefits for the patient. RAF has been brought into the game also in terms of uh, left ventricular dilation. And finally, even mTOR inhibitors were shown to, be, to play a role in regulation of cardiac cell growth and so on, and in the meta metabolic status. The good news is that inhibition of all of these kinases is certainly not sufficient to induce cardiac toxicity in our patients. Otherwise, the numbers of, sick, of clinically relevant cardiac toxicity would be much higher. We need definitely a second, third, or even fourth hit to, uh, to observe a clinically relevant cardiac toxicity. So what are these second and third, hit, third hits? First, there is data, and this has been published, from a quite in a significant energy rundown in the cardiac myocyte. 
These are biopsies from patients with TKI-induced congestive heart failure, and you can see that there is a serious alteration in the cardiac energy transduction on the uh, transmission electron microscopy. You can see marked uh, abnormalities in the mitochondrial structure, a collapse of the mitochondrial um, membrane potential, and a significant decrease in intracellular ATP. That alone might be manageable for the cardiac myocyte because um, there are prospective responses to restrict uh, energy utilization. Normally, under the, on, under the condition of energy depletion, uh, the cardiac myocytes, as any other cell, induces or activates AMP key. And AMP key uh, is a mechanism to protect the cells against ATP deficiency by just by turning off energy consuming biosynthesis uh, of cholesterol, for example. So that would work even in the setting of, um, of agents that impair kinases that are important, even in the setting of um, mitochondrial damage. The problem, however, is that, for example, sunitinib was shown to be a direct target of AMPK, and that a sunitinib is able to inhibit AMPK at biologically relevant concentrations. Finally, another second or third hit is the failed adaptation with cardiac stress. This energy depletion, together with AMPK inhibition, may become relevant only in the setting of increased cardiac stress. And this is the case, for example, in a patient with uncontrolled hypertension. And this has been also demonstrated in the, in the Maureen model in the setting of pressure overload. Uh, knockout, AMPK knockout mice had a greater loss of left ventricular function following our deconstruction. Um, Non-cardiac side effects may trigger cardiac toxicity, and here it's very important to think of the relationship between the thyroid gland and the heart. For example, the T3 hormone has on the nuclear level an important role in the cardiac myocyte where it regulates transcription of genes that enco encode for calcium ATPase exchanger voltage-gated potassium channels. T3 has also an important role on non-nuclear level of the cardiac myocyte, where it is involved in ion channels for sodium, potassium, etc. T3 has an important effect on the muscle cell. It directly affects the vascular smooth muscle cell and promotes relaxation. And finally, T3 and the cardiovascular system, a very old story, Hypothyroidism was shown to increase vascular resistance, uh, to increase endothelial dysfunction due to nit uh, reduced nitric oxide availability. So when we have a patient with low T3 level, we can impair, uh, expect impaired relaxation and ventricular filling, increase in peripheral vascular resistance and diastolic blood pressure, and reduced ejection fraction at exercise. Finally, we should consider the comorbidities of the patient and the co-medication as a potential trigger for cardiac toxicity. We shouldn't forget that the median age of a patient with renal cell cancer is 65 years, and the risk of a patient with metastatic renal cell cancer to have concomitant, either overt or subclinical cardiovascular comorbidity is quite high, above 70%. These patients may have plenty of drugs to treat their comorbidities. For example, um, patient, uh, drugs that prolong QT time, such as amiodarone. Amiodarone would be uh, quite, I wouldn't say risky, but amiodarone is, is a drug that you need to be aware of when you treat the patient with a tyrosine kinase inhibitor because the combination may dramatically increase the risk of dorsato point. Simvastatin, a very widely used drug, and you may have read this story. I think that apart from the well-known benefits in patients with coronary artery disease, also we as a medical oncologists may come to really love these drugs. There was this, study, this retrospective case control study involving a half million veterans uh, that reported of a protective role of statins against the development of renal cell cancer. 
Simvastatin, interestingly, was shown to suppress cell growth, to reduce tumor size in xenografts, and to in inhibit migration and invasion by inhibiting phosphorylation of AKT, mTOR, and ERK by suppressing interleukin-6, which is a major driver of renal cell cancer, by potentiating cytotoxic and uh, cytostatic activity of sorafenib, interestingly, not sun uh, sunitinib. So simvastatin sounds a very good co-medication for our patient. However, we need to be aware that at least in vitro, the cardiotoxic effect with soraf, uh, has been uh, synergistic with sorafenib. So what are the clinical implications of all of these findings? I think that management and prevention of cardiac toxicity from multi-kinase inhibitors may in the first place prevent on, uh, pr focus on the prevention of the second or third hit, which is the increased cardiac stress, for example, existing coronary artery disease that is not managed properly, existing hypertension. Hypertension is a good word because we have this new approach and this new temptation to provoke the second hit, to treat the patient to hypertension based on the data that were shown that if the patient develops blood pressure, the outcome is better. And this is a little bit against uh, the recommendation to treat or prevent the second hit hypertension. So my personal feeling here, and this is again supported also by these data that were uh, presented at asco -GU, that actually patients who are on, on uh, angiotensin inhibitors have a better outcome uh, when compared to patients who are non AZ non users, you can say that this information can kind of put you at ease a little bit if you are among those who treat to hypertension, who want to provoke hypertension to get a better outcome. We don't know whether this is an epiphenomenon or whether these agents really have anti tumor activity, but at, to some way it's nice thinking that they kind of support the, the anti-tumor activity of our drugs. And beta blockers, for example, were shown to induce apoptosis in endothelial cells, and they are established a standard of care for uh, hemangiomas in children. Angiotensin receptor blockers were shown to inhibit angiotensin to mediated growth and migration of cancer cells and angiogenesis. There are models with losartan stimulating the pro-apoptotic uh, pathways. There are, um, and there are uh, experiments conducted in osteosarcoma models clearly showing a loss in tumor weight just by adding angiotensin receptor blockers. And even calcium channels blockers were shown to reduce the proliferation of and migration of glioma cells. So I do believe if we are very careful and we, if we believe in this concept of treating to hypertension that we should be doing is, of course, we need to carefully uh, use these drugs, we need to carefully monitor the patient. I would never do this without seeing a patient every other week or uh, every three weeks. And whenever classical antihypertensive agents fail, consider that you have already an angiotensin receptor blocker, a beta blocker and everything in your patient, and the blood pressure is still high. There is recently data in patients on tyrosine kinase inhibitors, these are just cases nevertheless, that in this context where it is difficult to treat the patient, uh, uh, nitric oxide donors uh, might be helpful to control hypertension. Um, the use of molcidomine was shown to be successful in patients who were actually resistant to the classical uh, three or four antihypertensive strategies. What else uh, do we have as a clinical implications uh, from these findings? I think it's very important to involve the right cardiologist. Whenever you ask a cardiologist uh, what to do about your patient with subclinical or overt clinic uh, cardiac toxicity, and the cardiologist tells you, well, just discontinue your treatment, you are talking to the wrong person. You need a colleague who is interested in the patient and a, a, a colleague, colleague who is interested also in the field and who may work in the future closer with you. We should be aware of all relevant comorbidities and co-medications. Of course, we should correct T3 hypothyroidism. I came to the conclusion to keep it simple, as simple as possible, 
I treat cardiac issues today as I would do it in a patient without cancer. Meaning, if a patient requires coronary angiography, the patient is, going to, is being referred to coronary angiography, and so on. I'm not using and, and not developing anymore, and I did it at the beginning, I'm not using complicated, unvalidated renal cell cardiotoxicity algorithms that involve which drug to choose and the cardiovascular condition and so on. And of course, we should not deprive the patient of effective cancer treatment. We also should consider the benefits of simple approaches beyond AC inhibitors, beta blockers, highly important, consider that stress is really resolvable with beta blockers. And interestingly, there was recently a very nice uh, work presented by, um, by Dr. Scott showing that aerobic exercise induces cardioprotection by upregulation of VEGF expression, increase of endothelial progenitor cells, and um, erythropoietin secretion, which leads to differentiation into endothelial cells. And she recommended that patients who are on VEGF, on potent VEGF uh, TKI inhibitors, should uh, be offered this additional um, strategy. So to summarize, direct or indirect mode of action of tyrosine kinase inhibitors, the patient age, patient comorbidities and co-medication may trigger, I would say, changes in the cardiac myocyte. But there are many steps from subclinical changes to clinically overt toxicity. And the awareness of the treating physician, close monitoring of the patient, prevention of additional cardiac stress may prevent clinically relevant cardiotoxicity at all. We also should consider that um, congestive heart failure induced by multi-kinase inhibitors has always been reported to be reversible. The patient may tolerate the same drug for years after recovery and have such patients who have been longer after the cardiac event on, for example, sunitinib than they had been before without any additional event, if, of course, the patient is concomitantly treated against additional cardiac stress. Thank you very much.